Hello, Mama. I'm sorry it took so <coughs> long to call you back. down and cried I don't believe I thanked you one time for patching up my skinned up knees kissing my tears loving on me all the nights you laid away praying to God I'd make it home safe the countless things you went without so I could have what I have now I know I don't tell you like I ought to I love you, Mama Mama Ain't it just like you to make light all you done Make yourself out to be The lucky one Oh mama I'm afraid this time I'll have to disagree You're the best there is God gave you to me I'm so thankful all those little things For patching up my skin of knees Kissing my tears, loving on me For all the nights you laid away Praying to God I'd make it home safe To count the things you went without So I could have what I have now I know I don't tell you like I order but I love you, Mama. Oh, the countless things you went without, I never noticed, but I noticed now. Now I know I don't tell you like I ought to No, I don't tell you like I ought to But I love you seen the bumper stickers probably that that started out and it says got milk you seen those and then after a while it was got this and got that and, well I'm waiting to see one that says got trouble and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning God and our troubles when you when the world seems to be falling apart do you ever wonder if God has abandoned you or maybe just sat this one out we got earthquakes and tornadoes. You saw about tornadoes on the news up in Colorado yesterday and floods and volcanoes, shootings in schools and churches, raging brush fires out west, mudslides. It just really seems like the world's falling apart. Can I get an amen? You don't have to watch the news very long to, to see that. Well, when we add to this the the number of friends and relatives and acquaintances that are being struck down with various diseases and, and uh, health issues, we can sometimes just feel overwhelmed with all of this. But we should not find this to be strange because we know deep down inside that we can never escape these troubles in this world. In um, 
in the book of Job. Y'all remember Job, the guy in the Old Testament? The, the one that we call him the, the, the great sufferer of old. I mean, if anybody ever suffered, we go to read the book of Job, and all of a sudden we don't feel quite so bad because we look at what Job went through. He says, man is born to trouble just as the sparks fly upward. But sometimes troubles come to us or those that we know and love in such overwhelming proportions that it may begin to shake our faith a little bit or twist our perspective on how we look at things or cause us to feel like God is just really not there watching over us anymore. So this leaves us a question of why and just where God fits into the picture, what is God's role in our troubles? And that's what we want to address this morning. I want us to look at four reasons why you can and you should trust God in the midst of your troubles. First of all, we can trust God in the midst of our troubles because, listen closely, He allows our troubles to come. This is a far cry from saying that God directly and deliberately causes troubles in our lives. He doesn't do that. If we thought that, we would be in danger of making God the author of evil, which is contrary to His Word, obviously. Yet we open, the Bible openly tells us that in His Word that we will have troubles in this life. And all the way through it, we're going to have problems. We're going to have trials. We're going to have troubles. We're going to have difficulties. Whatever label you want to put on to them, this life is not easy, is it? Isaiah chapter 43 gives us some insight here in verses 2 and 3. We find God speaking through his servant to the captive peoples of Judah suffering in captivity in Babylon. This is when they were taken in captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. It says there, when you pass through the waters... It goes on to say, and through the rivers. And it says, when you walk through the fire. Note that it does not say, if you should happen to have trouble, but it says, when that trouble comes to you. Not if, but when. John chapter 16 in the New Testament, verse 33, we find there that Jesus is bluntly telling his disciples, in the world you will have tribula tribulation. So I don't know why we think that life's going to be a bed of roses when we come to Jesus. Jesus said it's going to be difficult. There's going to be hard times in our lives. God allowed the possibility of suffering and troubles when he first determined in the Garden of Eden to give mankind a choice. And that choice brought on some problems, didn't it? He allowed us to be moral agents. But as a result of this free choice, sin entered in and began the host of troubles that we have throughout the world and have had ever since that time. So our troubles are the result of us living in a sinful and fallen world. I do not want you to, I'm going to throw in a disclaimer right here, I do not want you to think that your troubles are never created by your own efforts. But ultimately we have difficulties and trials because sin has entered into the world. Secondly, we can trust God in the midst of our troubles because, listen closely, He not only allows our troubles, but He shares them. He shares in our troubles. While God does not spare us from trouble, He does accompany us in our sufferings and trials. You know, a picture immediately comes to my mind when I say that, and if, if I can draw you back to the book of Daniel in the chapter where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. Do you all remember that story? It's not just a story. It's not just a Bible story. It's a true event that took place. And so when we talk about uh, Jesus walking with us through our problems and our troubles, I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Nebuchadnezzar himself, the king, looked into the fiery furnace after they had been thrown in there, and he says, hey, guards, how many guys did you just throw into the furnace? And they said, three. And Nebuchadnezzar makes this statement. He says, I see a fourth man walking around in the fire, and he looks like the Son of Man. There was something different about him. And so I just want you, when you feel like God has left you, I want you to think about this, that God shares in our troubles and he's walking in that fire when we're going through it. 
He's right there with us. His words from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, continue to ring true today. When you pass through the waters, he says, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, implied, I will be with you. And they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, what? I will be with you, he says. You will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. I'm telling you, when we're walking through troubles and difficulties in our life, and there's hardships, and, and it can be relational, it can be financial, it can, it can be church-related, it can be at work, but you do not have to walk through those trials alone. Because Christ says, if you will make me Lord of your life and Savior, I will walk with you through your problems. And I take comfort in that personally. Amen. Here we're told that in all of these various trials of life, God promises his people that he will be our strength and our stay. He will be our shield and our supply. So I want you to think about those four words. He's our strength. He gives us the strength, the stamina to make it through. And he is our stay. We are fixed on him. But he's also our shield. That means that he protects us. In the New Testament, Paul talks about the fiery darts of the evil one being extinguished by the shield of faith. You know, in Roman times when this was written, everyone was very familiar with a Roman shield. It was a, a piece of a wood about yay wide and about four foot tall, three and a half, four foot tall, and it was unique. It had, a, it had a double band on the back where you could slip your arm through and then grab the other strap with your fist and hold it up and you could move it like this. But there was something very interesting about the Roman shield. It was covered with a thick layer of leather. And before they went into battle, they would soak the leather with water so that when arrows were shot at them and they hit their shield, the water in the leather, leather would extinguish the fiery dart. Amen? So they knew exactly what Paul was talking about when he talks about the shield of faith. In Psalm chapter 46, verse 1, it's a familiar assurance that God is always with us in our times of trouble. It says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Ever-present. God doesn't leave us. You know, sometimes in life we feel like uh, just everything is overwhelming to us. Can I get an amen? You just feel like everything is, is a big wave and it's just sweeping over you and you just can't do it all. You can't deal with all of it. There's too many issues going on. But Jesus says that I'm ever-present help there with you. So what we do is rather than look at all our problems and our troubles and say, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. We just need to simply turn from them and turn to Christ. To get down sometimes literally on our hands and knees and just bow down before Almighty God who created heaven and earth and say, God, you see this wave of trouble that's overflowing me. And I need your help because you promised to be an ever-present help in the time of trouble. If God said it, can you believe it? If God said it, can you count on it in times of trouble? But I wonder sometimes how often when we're in the middle of trouble that we don't turn to Christ. We may mumble a little prayer or something on the side, but ultimately we're looking at what's facing us. We're looking at the tsunami that's coming in, fixing to flood our whole existence. And instead of focusing on the tsunami... Instead of focusing on the trouble or the issue that's going on in your life, maybe we should turn our attention back to Christ. Maybe we should refocus on Him and not on what we face. Because He's bigger than what we face. He's bigger than a tsunami. Amen? The idea of God's presence always with us is carried forward even more powerfully in the New Testament where Jesus promises in Matthew 28, verse 20, and surely I am with you always. Through the ages, God's people have experienced his presence in the face of trouble. They have felt God's strengthening hand, and you have too, if you've turned to him in your time of trouble. And they knew that they did not suffer alone. That God truly cares about what we are experiencing in our life. 
So he allows troubles. He shares our troubles. But listen to this. He also conquers them. In the midst of our troubles, God, we can trust God because he conquers our troubles and overcomes them. The Bible makes it abundantly plain that God's will for man is not that he should be spared problems. God didn't say that. You know, some people say, well, if you come to Jesus, God will take all your problems away and he'll fix everything for us. Do you know that to be in the Bible? I think I read something just to the contrary, that when God allows troubles to come, he says he'll comfort us, he'll be with us, but he also says that he's going to conquer those. God didn't promise me a rose garden, but he did make some promises. The Bible also teaches that it is God's will that we be victorious over the worst of what life can throw at us. I got the victory, amen? Victory in Jesus. How many of you know that song? How many times have we sung victory in Jesus? Well, the question is, when you're in the midst of a storm, do you believe it? Or do you just sing the song at church? Do we just mouth words when we sing to God in worship? Or do we breathe to God through those words? Do we express our heartfelt love and devotion to Christ when we sing these praise and worship songs and songs like Leaning on the Everlasting Arms? Are we just mouthing words or do we believe what we sing? When we look, we find that our Lord telling his disciples just a few hours before he was to leave them via his death on the cross, he says this to them, in this world, that's where you and I live, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world, Jesus says in John 16, I have overcome the world. Listen, you are an overcomer. I hear songs on the radio sometimes, and it talks. Uh, I hear this one little uh, bird chirping voice lady singing. I mean, she's just she's a super soprano. I think she'd shatter glass, and and she's singing this song, and it's just over and over about I'm an overcomer in Christ. I'm an overcomer in Christ. Well, I want you to ask yourself, what's in your life that you need to overcome? What kind of problem is it? What kind of habit is it? What kind of issue is it that you need to overcome in your life for, with Christ? Christ's given you the power. Same power raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And that power is available to us as we put our faith, hope, love, trust, and service and obedience in Christ. I see too many Christians walking around today that are almost depressed. I mean, in the Christian community, it's not any different than in the secular community because lots of Christians are in antidepressants. I, I'm, I know that we have physical imbalances sometimes, and I'm not saying that you, no one should ever take an antidepressant, but what I am saying is the antidepressant that's best for you, his name is Jesus. And when you let him into your life and obey him, he's going to fix those things that are problems in your life as you turn them over to him. How many of you got a problem in your life? Hmm? And you're thinking, Brother Stan's just saying, all I got to do is turn it over to Jesus. That's correct. That's what the Bible says. And when you turn the problem over to Jesus, listen to me, what else you're turning over to Jesus is you. Jesus wants you. And when you give yourself totally and completely to Christ, then he can work in your life to perform miracles, to bring you over your trials, your troubles, your, tr your depression, your issues, your heartaches. Christ can do all of that even though it required Jesus to experience the worst of troubles, what did he experience? Rejection, loneliness, prejudice, hatred, persecution, pain, and finally death. We know that he is now able to assure us of a final and complete victory because of what he's done for us. 
He paid the price. He empowered the believer. You know, he just didn't save you. He gave you himself in the person of the Holy Spirit to live in you. In the Old Testament, we have ten commandments. Man could not keep those. God knew it, but he gave them the commandments so they would know what sin was. And then it's ironic because in the New Testament, Jesus says, I didn't come to do away with those ten. I came to fulfill them and hold you to a higher standard. Now, wait a minute. We could not even keep the original standard, and Jesus has come and brings us, raises the bar. He brings up the higher standard. Now, how are we supposed to meet a higher standard when we could not keep the basic ten? And I'm going to tell you why. Because on this side of the cross, after the day of Pentecost, when a person gives their, sells their life out to Jesus Christ, he empowers them to do what they, we could not do with the Ten Commandments. And he raised the bar, but he empowered us. Now we can get over the bar. Amen? We can do what Christ has commanded. He didn't say, I want you to be uh, loving people and share the gospel and love everybody. We can't do that in our own power, our own might. But with Christ in us, we can do all things through Christ who is in us. Amen? We can do it. We got to make up our mind to do it. We got to determine to do it. And we got to be intentional about doing it. But we can do it. So, why are we living defeated lives? I'm taking you someplace I didn't even have an idea I was going. Why are we living defeated lives here when Christ has made a way? He says, You don't have to live like that. Wow, Lord, I know you're talking to me personally, but I hope everybody's hearing this. Wow. We have the victory in Jesus. There's a guy named Dr. John Anderson. He wrote this about suffering is not a denial of God's love. It is but another sphere in the operation. God's purpose encompasses more than a physical existence. With him, our spiritual welfare comes first. Our destiny is not to be comfortable on the earth, but to be conformed to the image of his Son in heaven. You see, God did not promise you a rose garden, but what he did promise you was victory over the world as you live for Christ. Victory over your troubles, over those things that are you just can't seem to handle. You know, everything that you face the answer is Jesus. I saw a billboard one time said, what's your question? The answer is Jesus. What's your problem? The answer is Jesus. And, and well, I don't want to oversimplify that, but you know, the truth of the matter is, when we come to Christ, He loves us and died for us, and we become His children. And do you think, would a parent who loves their kids do anything that would hurt their children? Absolutely not. In fact, the nature of a mother, even a father, is to die for their children, to put their life on the line, when someone, to step in front of their child, whatever it is, and take the bullet in a spiritual sense, or in even a physical sense. We would, not, we would lay our lives down for our children. How much more does God love you? He laid his life down for you. The fourth point I want to make in closing is that we can trust God in the midst of our troubles because God uses our troubles. Have you ever thought about that? <coughs> Excuse me. That God uses our troubles? On the surface, we might wish for a world without troubles. Well, you think, would that be nice? But such a, a possibility, would, would we would really be the losers if that were the case because troubles are used by God to benefit us, to grow us. The Bible makes it clear that God does use our troubles. We can go back in the Bible and we can just start picking and choosing and looking at all these things. Let me share with you a few. He used Joseph. Remember Joseph in Egypt? Remember Joseph being sold into slavery because his brothers threw him in a hole? All right. Joseph's adversities to save, they saved Israel from extinction. Otherwise, Israel would have starved. What about Solomon, uh, Samson? Samson's affliction to wreck, he used that to wreck the vengeance upon enemies of God, the Philistines. You remember Samson? 
who was blinded and hair cut off. And I mean, he really messed up. He was a man that God used, but he really messed up. He, he was a trip. Do you hear me? You read about Samson. God take, by the way, I want you to realize God takes imperfect people, raise your hand, <laughs> and he uses them for his glory. And he used Job's suffering to teach the necessity of unwavering faith. We talked a lot about Job this morning, but he's a character that you can go back and you can look at and you can really be encouraged by. He used Babylonian captivity of Israel to discipline, of Judah rather, to discipline and cleanse the nation of Judah after their apostasy. They were turning away from God. And God told, kept telling them through the prophets, you know, you need to turn back to God. You need to get rid of foreign wives that are bringing in false religions. You need to get rid of Baal worship. You need to get rid of all of these things in your life that are staining you. And you need to turn back to the one true living God because they were in apostasy. And so he sent King Nebuchadnezzar to come in and he took Judah into captivity. And that's where we get the book of Daniel. So we see positive things coming out of God using our troubles. And he used Paul's hardship to spread the gospel throughout the whole Roman Empire. You know, Paul was beaten and shipwrecked and run out of town and scourged. And he used all of that to promote the gospel. This morning in our class, we were studying Philippians, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And he was in jail when he wrote that letter. And he says, I rejoice. I'm telling you what, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And what about Martin Luther? He was excommunicated, but through that he reformed the church. And then there's a man that I hope you know, recent in the 20th century. He used Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He used his death in a concentration camp to stir the conscience of the world against the evils of Nazism. And so God takes people who have mega problems, mega troubles, hardships, difficulties, and sufferings, and he brings good out of them. Remember the scripture, Romans 8, 28. Are you thinking? What is that scripture? God works all things together for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. God takes bad things in people's lives and brings good out of them. Amen? So I know you've had hardships and difficulties in your life at times. And you can look back and say, well, God did something great out of that. I, wanna, I shared with the Sunday school class this morning about I called my doctor this week because I was sick. And I finally said, well, I'm going to call him and get an appointment. And I'm going to go see my doctor. And I call and I'm, they're on the phone. They tell me, well, he's not in today. Uh, we have someone else in. And I thought, well, this is a bummer. And yet God had an encounter for me and this other person that I saw as a doctor. Had a God encounter thing going on there. And I'm telling you, when you think something might be bad, God's going to bring some good out of it. Why? Because you're called according to his purpose. You are ambassadors for Christ. He does live in you, and he wants to bring glory to his name through your life and what he brings you out of. You think, well, I'm in the middle of stuff and God hasn't brought me out of it yet. But you know, you hang in there with God and God will bring good out of anything that you go through. Let me wrap this up this morning by saying that I hope you can see that you can trust God because he will use our troubles to bless us if we let him, if we let him. So he allows them to come. He shares in them with us. He ultimately uses our troubles to benefit us and to bless us and to grow us. And finally, in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, he says this, And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character brings about hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts and through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I'm telling you, this is a, a, a word from the Lord today 
that I know that we got troubles in life. And if you don't have them today, you're going to have them. They're coming because it's not if we have troubles, it's when we have them.